Ninth Story Studios, giving story a voice. You're listening to the Wicked Library. <laughs> Hello, my name is Daniel Morden. I'm a storyteller from Wales in the UK. For 30 years, I've made my living telling myths, legends, fairy tales and folk tales. Now, during this crazy year, stories I read or heard many years ago have wormed their way back into my memory, like a snatch of melody I couldn't place. It was as if they were whispering, listen, I can help. So when I track down the stories, they seem to have something to say about the pandemic and the way our lives have changed. So I've told these stories in a podcast. Every episode consists of just one story. It goes out weekly on Sundays. And if you're interested, you can give it a try at www.danielmorden.org slash podcast. Thanks for your time. Hello, and welcome to episode number 1018 of the Wicked Library. I'm Daniel Foytek, and I thank you for listening. This year might be drawing to a close, but season 10 just keeps on giving. In fact, this month we have two more episodes for you, a private collector episode, and of course our annual Chris Massacre episode. And there are still more stories left in the season coming January. A big thank you to those who took the time to rate us five stars, and write a short review for us on iTunes. Your ratings do help others find the show, and, as we always say, we love hearing from you. In fact, the librarian occasionally selects a review to read on the show, so if you submit a five-star rating and review of the show in iTunes, there's a good chance the librarian might share yours on the show in the near future, like he does today. Hello, kiddies. This is your librarian, and I wanted to share with you a nice review that we got on iTunes from The K Divine. Top notch audio anthology of horror. Couldn't have said it better myself, K Divine. Do you want new stories of horror from Minds Creating today? Look no further than here. Stop and listen, and don't be too afraid to shiver. (laughs) Excellent audio quality and craft from the writers. I love the library. Well, the K-Divine, the library loves you right back. Keep those reviews coming, kiddies. Who knows, maybe I'll read them on the air one of these days. (laughs) Toodles! Speaking of your librarian, he says the perfect Christmas gift to scare your friends, family, or even someone you don't like very much, comes in the form of our first written anthology, 13 Wicked Tales, available on Amazon in print and Kindle. Why not skip the milk and cookies this year and leave Santa something wicked and fun to read instead? Grab your copy at thewickedlibrary.com forward slash read. It's packed with great tales by some of your favorite authors from the show. The book also features beautiful cover art and illustrations by Jeanette Andromeda. It's a fantastic collection, and we know you'll want a copy for your own Wicked Library. Again, get yours now at thewickedlibrary.com forward slash read. As always, before we get Wicked today, a big thank you to those of you who are supporting the show. We've had several new supporters sign up on Patreon, and we all deeply thank you. Without you, this show would not be possible. On behalf of our authors and everyone else involved in making the show, a sincere thank you for your support of this show and of independent horror fiction. If you're not yet supporting the show, you can do that at patreon.com forward slash wicked library. Today's episode features a dark tale by an author new to the wicked library. We're very proud to introduce 2018 Stoker Awards finalist and 2019 SFPA award winner Angela Eureka Smith, who wrote today's tale told by one of our favorite voice actresses, Sarah Ruth Thomas. The custom score for today's tale was created by Nico Vitese, 
of We Talk of Dreams. Please, if you enjoy the story, find Angela's work and buy it. It keeps her making more. You can learn more about Angela and find links to her other work on her bio page at thewickedlibrary.com and at amazon.com. Now, sometimes we tell lies. We've all done it. Big ones, small ones, sometimes to spare someone's feelings or to protect someone we care about or even ourselves. But most of us don't make a habit of it. In today's story, we meet a woman who has practiced lying so often that she has become an expert. Listen in as she tells a wicked tale called How I Became a Professional Liar. Ah, so you've come in search of a story, have you? Well, you've come to the right place. My private collection of dark tomes are hungry for your fear, filled with stories that are sure to terrify, disturb, and delight. Be warned, though, these tales are not for sensitive listeners. You're going to hear things that will upset and quite possibly offend. Ah, here's a good one. Follow me now and we'll enjoy this tale together. It's story time at the Wicked Library. (laughs) Now, tell me, when you woke up this morning... Did you ever think your day would end up like this? I bet you never expected to meet me in person. And yet here I am. And lucky you. You get to be my latest subject. You won't get to enjoy it much, I admit. But rest assured, you will be getting your 15 minutes of fame after this. I know it's impolite to speak it, but to be honest, we're all liars. Just not all of us get paid for it. That's the difference between a professional and an amateur. The money, honey. Otherwise, we're pretty much all the same. I'm just honest about it. For right now, anyways. My mama claimed I was a liar from birth. I can't really say if this is true, because though I swear I was there, I don't remember a thing. I came out of the womb blue, she said, and lifeless. The doctor pulled me free and I came out all at once with all my accompanying afterbirth and fluids, in a whoosh. She said I was so lifeless, I fell onto the table with a thunk and didn't move a muscle. The doctors thought I was stillborn, of course. They picked up my stiff little body and rubbed it all over, trying to get my blood flowing. But nothing worked. They tried for what seemed to her like an eternity before they gave up. That's how the story went, anyways. They laid my little body on the table to one side and covered me with a cloth diaper so my mother could calm down and not see me. Then, so they say, one of my little fists punched straight up in the air and pulled that cloth right off my face. My mother said they all just stared. My eyes were still closed and my face was still blue. I looked exactly like a little baby corpse, she used to say. One of the nurses moved toward me, probably to pull the cloth back over my face, when my eyes snapped open. My mother said she screamed. I would have loved to see that. Apparently, I just looked at the nurse and then at the rest of everybody that was part of this ordeal. I blinked and yawned. My mother had been too busy sobbing to realize I was alive until that moment. She saw the yawn, she said, and then yelled for the nurses to move their asses and bring me over. She looked down at my little blue face and declared me a little liar right then from my first breath. I had lied to the room about being dead and almost got away with it. Yeah, I don't honestly believe it either, But that's what it says in my biography, so it's true enough. If you ask me, my mother was the original liar. Really, because of this first crazy story of hers, 
She started my own career in the art of untruthing. My mama liked attention. And that story of her little dead baby dug it up in spades. Some said that it was Jesus that done it. Some said the devil. The problem was that Madison just wasn't big enough to safely hold such a tall tale. So naturally, there were repercussions. Lies that big in such a small town have consequences. I guess that's me. I'm the consequence. The best stories grow from a speck of truth. I don't know if I was ever as blue as she always said, like a late summer berry, but I have always been pale. Because of this, you can see my veins knitting their way beneath my skin. I guess it's their hue that makes people believe I started life that color. <laughs> people believe what they want to believe. I figured out early on, even when their own eyes tell them otherwise. But that's good. That's why people like me can get away with <laughs> whatever we want. Because of her stories, I grew up kind of famous. Granted, it was just in our town, and probably outside of Hopkins County, no one would have known me from Adam. But in Madisonville, Kentucky, I grew up a star from day one. If you've ever read the grocery store tabloids, you know how hard that can be on a child to grow up with all those eyes upon her. That was me, all right. I was like an ugly little Judy Garland growing up. All the attention and no love. But this story isn't a sad one. So don't worry, I'm going to bring your mood down. I mean, not farther than you'd be naturally in your situation. So here I was, barely able to walk as a toddler and surrounded by outlandish tales about how I came back from the dead. I couldn't grow fast enough to keep up with all those tall tales. You know how those small towns are. Bored folks are the most dangerous kind, and small towns breed plenty of them. They'll sell their sister to the devil to get something to talk about. My mama told her stories about me because they got her bigger tips, I imagine. She never thought anything would come of it, but all the grown-ups would whisper about me and my mother behind our backs. Always polite to our faces, bless their hearts. But you know how that goes. The problem with those grown-ups talking behind our back is that some of them had kids that could overhear all the talking. The kids added their own spin onto how odd I was, and the stories just got bigger. Consequently, my formative years were particularly lacking. I had no friends, and since my mama worked nearly all the time, no family. That meant I had no one to stick up for me. This may seem like an unfair burden to place upon my childish shoulders, but I am a firm believer in trials and tribulations bettering us. The other kids made fun of me as soon as I hit school. They always said my favorite color was blue and called me Blueberry. That was better than the ones that said I was a vampire and would leave garlic cloves in my book bag. It hurt, but there's no great loss without some little gain. Two good things came out of it. First off, I learned to read well, because I'd regularly hide in the library over on Union Street. Books are to jerks what garlic is to vampires. The only people I ever found hiding between the stacks were librarians and other bookworms. Second thing that all that cruelty taught me was, there's not a lot of difference between a hero and a villain. It's all perspective. Because of that, I was able to keep an open mind during a crisis and find out there's good, good money in telling lies. And it started with the wonderful death of Russ Crowder. Not wonderful for him, mind you. The happy in that ending was all mine. I didn't hate the boy, but Russ Crowder deserved everything he got and more. He wasn't just mean to me. Russ was mean to everything. He'd go out of his way to kick a dog if he saw one. He pushed little kids over for the fun of it. Everyone said he tossed six kittens in his daddy's fire pit just to hear them scream. No one liked Russ, and no one liked me. But they feared Russ. That put me at the level of those kittens. To Russ, 
I was just a scream waiting to happen. Then, one day it all ended. On the days when the library was closed, I'd taken to hiding in an old tool shed in the woods. The house had been burned down, but the tool shed was more or less in one piece. There wasn't much inside but some rusty tools propped against the wall and a wooden crate full of spider webs. A few boards had fallen off the back, making it perfect for a summer hangout. No one knew about this place but me. I'd even nailed some scraps of mosquito net across them to keep the pests out. The screen worked great for biting bugs, but it didn't work to keep Russ out. One day I was in there reading, and I was so caught up in the world of little women, I never heard a footstep or a twig snap outside my shack. One minute I'm hoping Joe will just shut up and kiss Laurie, and the next second my shack door squeaks open and I'm staring up at Russ. His face was split into the meanest grin I've ever seen. Maybe it's because I was so rudely jerked from one world and back into this one that I reacted the way I did. Maybe it was something glinting in his eyes I didn't like. Regardless, I backpedaled right through my makeshift screen to land on my backside so hard all my breath was knocked clean out of me. I heard all the old tools falling and banging around before my butt had touched the mud. And then Russell gave a shriek worse than I imagined those kittens ever did. I looked up and I could see his face looking at me through the open space. His eyes were popping out of his head like a frog's. He was opening and closing his mouth, but no sound was coming out except squeaks. I was shocked to stone, just staring at the boy that had invaded my hut. Then a whole bunch of spit just started to run down his chin. Still no words, just thick saliva slicking up his face. It was when the spit went red that I realized something was wrong with him. Russ Crowder was drooling blood out of his mouth like a thirsty dog, and all I could do was sit on my ass and watch. I don't know how long we sat there like that, with me staring and him bleeding out. I've read that when people die, you can see a light go out in their eyes. I've never seen that. I only knew he was dead when a fly landed on his chin and started lapping up on that spit. I'm sure I called out his name, but I don't remember. At some point, I got up and looked through the gap at him. I kept my muscles tense and ready to run if this was just another one of his tricks. His face had become an open bar for flies, and I decided he wasn't faking. Through the gap, I could see Russ kind of hanging in midair. One leg was bent forward like a sprinter in a race, the other was stretched out straight behind him. His arms just dangled. For a minute, I couldn't figure out how he was holding up like that. And then I noticed a weathered gray pole through his chest. It wasn't exactly all the way through. When I looked for it, I could see an old pitchfork tine sticking out through his back. He was propped up like a doll between the old pitchfork and the wall. Two things popped through my head. One was that Russ Crowder was dead and was never going to hurt me again. The other was that I'd killed him. I backed out of there then, I can tell you. First, I was sneaking so no one would see me, even though I'd never even seen anyone in those woods before Russ crashed in. After I got away from there, I ran as fast as I could to put space between me and what I'd just done. I didn't think jail was a good place for ten-year-old girls, but it was a good place for murderers. At that moment, I was both. I've read how people say an event of significance imprints on their minds, and they remember every smell, noise, and texture of that moment. That's not me at all. All I can remember of that turning point were the flies on Russ's sticky chin. How all that drool had come out first. It wasn't like I'd seen on TV. There wasn't a nice, fresh curtain of tinted corn syrup covering Russ's chin. It was sticky rivulets running through his thick spit, like spiderweb tentacles searching for a safe spot. Then came blood. 
And flies. Flies are the worst tattletales I've learned. Mama wasn't at home when I tore through the door. That was lucky for me, and no surprise. It gave me time to calm down. I made a jelly sandwich and sat on the couch to consider my options. On the plus, there was no more rust to make me miserable. All the rest of the kids just followed his lead because they were afraid. After him, I was the next scariest kid in town, but for different reasons. At that point, I reckoned I could take his spot at the top of the heap if I played my hand correctly. On the negative, I could go to jail for what I did. I didn't think the police would care if it was my actual hand that drove in that pitchfork. I'd practically lived in that shed all summer, and so I knew my fingerprints would be on everything if they looked. It was around then that I got really scared. I realized they'd never bothered to dust for prints because I'd left the perfect evidence behind with my name on it. I know you don't have time for a long story, so I won't make you guess. Remember the book I was reading when Russ busted in? Yep. Little Women was probably laying there on the shed floor, incriminating me. There would be a big fat finger pointed from the HCM library right at me. I either had to keep the authorities from ever finding that shed, or showed them where to look and who to blame. The best ideas come at the worst of times. It was at that moment that my brain hatched up the perfect plan. One thing in my life I can depend on is my mama to tell stories on me. It was her stories that started my whole mess, and she loved the attention. I imagined if I told her a new story, it'd be a win-win for us all. I mean, most of us. The more I thought about my idea, the more I could see it would be more like a public service. After some more thinking, I realized even Russ got something from this ordeal. He was saved from growing up into an even bigger dick than he had already been. In fact, with him gone, I probably saved a lot of people from future pain. I waited till I heard my mama come home that night. I gave her a few minutes to put her bag down and settle. Her keys dropped on the counter. She kicked off her shoes. I waited until I heard the fridge open so she could put her leftovers away, and I started screaming up a storm. I waited until I heard the fridge open so she could put her leftovers away, and I started screaming up a storm. I knew hearing me scream after a long day of work was the last thing she needed, but it had to be done. She came rushing in, flipped on the light, and ran to my bed. I remember her apron still being on. I was going to keep screaming until she called the police, but she started shaking me so hard I worried my head was going to come off. I stopped, looked her in the eyes, all mysterious. You need to call the police, Mama, I told her. Russ Crowder is dead. It didn't go quite like I thought after that. She asked me what I was talking about, and I told her I dreamed the whole thing. I knew where his body was, and I knew who did it. She told me to go back to bed. It was just a dream. I hadn't expected that reaction. If my kid had woken up like that screaming, I'd hope I would have the decency to listen to them. Mama wasn't that decent, and I got upset with her, but for real. If this didn't go right, I was actually going to go to jail. I couldn't tell her this, but in hindsight, it worked well for me. I got so worked up, I started sobbing. Finally, she made me drink sugar and whiskey to make me tired, and I fell asleep. Sure, I was destined to be a jailbird because my mama didn't take me serious. Turns out, God must have hated Russ as much as me, because he worked everything out in my favor. I slept in late that day. There wasn't anything to get up for, really. The library was closed on Sunday. I couldn't hang out at my shack now, and I didn't have friends. My brain got to working overtime about the book I'd left. First off, I could have used the entertainment by vanishing into that happy world. Second off, it was all that really tied me to the crime except for fingerprints, 
and I'd heard somewhere you could burn those off yourself with an iron. I had just worked myself into believing I'd better risk getting that book back when everything popped into place. I had just put my shoes on so I could sneak over there, but when I opened the door, the sheriff was standing on the step with my mama. She had her hand in her purse to pull out her keys. I figured he might be there to put me in jail, so I told him I knew he'd show up. He looked scared when I said that and looked at my mama. She even looked nervous. As an adult now, thinking back, I'd probably been a little creeped out as well given the circumstances. But at that time, I was just trying to show him I wasn't afraid. I was. Turns out, he wasn't there to arrest me, but asked me about my dream. Good old mama had already spread the news of my strange dream about Russ all over most of Madisonville before 10 o'clock that morning. What she didn't know was Russ's mama had been knocking on the sheriff's door at 10 o'clock the night before, asking him to put a search party out for her missing boy. She didn't work nights, so when Russ didn't come home after dark, she got worried. The sheriff had put her off until morning, but when Don showed up without Russ, he took her serious. Enter my beautiful, loudmouth mama blabbing about all the tribulations she endured from having an odd child. While I was worrying about if I was going to jail, the foundation for my future success was being laid out. The sheriff asked me all about my dream, and I told him every gory detail, even how the flies were reenacting the Last Supper on Russ's face. I even mentioned dreaming my lost library book was there and said I'd been looking for it all week. I was able to conjure real tears for the event. Russ deserved what he got, and I had no sympathy for him, but going to jail started up my waterworks. Despite that, I couldn't resist telling the sheriff my dream was so real, it was like I was there. I had to bury my face in my hands so he wouldn't see me smiling at my own joke. He pinned a plastic sheriff star to my shirt then and asked if I could be brave and show him where I thought all this happened. I told him I'd try and that I hoped they'd find Russ okay and maybe he just ran away from home and I was just being silly. I said I hoped it was all just a dream and the sheriff hugged me and said he did too. You should have seen the commotion when I led them right to this little hidden tool shed in the middle of nowhere. I refused to go in because I was too scared, and that was actually the full-on truth. Seeing that shed again shook me up, and I didn't trust myself to stay calm in there if I saw Russ again. I mean, he deserved it, but still, I'm not a monster. All hell broke loose then. The sheriff was yelling and talking on his walkie-talkie. My mom was crying and hugging me. When the sheriff came out of that shed, it looked like someone had painted a bottle of paste all over his face. I think when he looked at me, he got even whiter somehow. He asked my mom to take me home in a choked-up voice, like he was going to cry. That surprised me. I didn't think anyone would cry over Russ. Everyone knew he was a bad egg, Except maybe his own mama. We got a milkshake on the way home, and my mama asked me all about my dream again, but she actually listened this time. It was the best day of my life. Everyone in the diner was listening to me. I could tell. The daytime waitress stopped wiping the counter, and even Eddie came from the back to listen. He let a burger burn on the grill. I was a hit. That evening, the sheriff came by our house again and asked Mama to step outside. I got nervous then. What if they'd figured it out? They hadn't even asked me if I had dreamed who did it yet, meaning he might think it was me. The stupid library book hadn't been brought up again, but that pretty much pointed to me as being there if they thought about it for half a second. Lucky for me, they didn't. When they did come in, the sheriff had a Charleston chew for me, and told me what a brave girl I had been, and what a big help. If it weren't for me, he said, they'd have never found Russ. In a way, that was true. If it wasn't for me, they wouldn't have had to find Russ in the first place. 
so I felt justified in enjoying my candy. Then, the sheriff came to a moment of glory. I know this is really, really tough on you, he says, all serious. I want you to know that I will keep you safe no matter what. Did your dream tell you who did this? At that moment, I know I just stared at him with my mouth hanging open, probably showing off a wad of half-chewed candy. It would help us a lot, he said to assure me. You might be saving the lives of other boys and girls by telling us. I know he thought I paused because I was scared, but to be honest, I really could barely hear him over the sound of a thousand angels singing my name. It was all just too perfect. When I closed my mouth again, I just nodded and said a name. It was Igor, I told him. He knew who I was talking about. I looked away in case he could see the fib in my eyes. The old Russian? He asked me, but he knew. We were in the middle of Kentucky. There weren't any other Igors around, or even old Russians for that matter. Igor lived alone, had come out of nowhere, and he talked funny. The whole town said he did black magic, so this was probably God's way of finally punishing him. Igor was pretty old, so he'd been getting away with it for a long time. The sheriff believed me all right. Not only did he thank me, but would you believe he pulled out a $20 bill and handed it right to me? I heard my mother gasp. That was a lot of money to us. The sheriff said it was for my services. My life changed at that moment, with me staring down into the eyes of President Jackson. I became a professional. Everything got real crazy after that. First, the newspaper came by and asked me all about my dream. People sent me gifts in the mail. Now that Russ was dead, everyone else turned into liars and told stories about what a sweet boy he was. Even my mama made out, because people started leaving her extra big tips because her child was such a hero. She was so proud of me after that. As far as Igor was concerned, it looked like I'd been right about him. When they arrested him, they searched his house. And would you believe they found a stack of children's picture books next to his bed? He claimed they were his own sons that had died long ago, but no one believed him. Why would a grown man keep kids' books if he didn't have kids? His own mama had cursed him the day she named him Igor. I mean, that's a monster's name, obviously. You might think that would be the end of it. And it probably would have been, if it weren't for Claire MacDonald. As I grew, I had become a real showstopper in Madisonville. Not exactly pretty, mind you, but I was popular in a way. By the time we all hit high school, everyone thought I was the most amazing thing since Pickled Pig's Feet. I was invited to every party, so I could use my psychic powers to tell the girls who they would marry one day. Boys asked me silly stuff, like who was going to win state next season. The answers were pretty easy to come up with. It doesn't take a psychic to figure out who the fastest runner is out of a half dozen or who someone has a crush on. The few times I was wrong, I'd quietly claim responsibility to the winner, insinuating maybe I'd pulled some supernatural strings to influence things in their favor. People swallow lies whole if that's what they want to believe. They practically beg you to lie if it boosts their ego. So really, it's another public service. But I digress. Claire McDonald. I was ruling our freshman year of high school when Claire's parents up and decided to divorce and pawn her off on her grandmother. Unfortunately for me, and later Claire... Her grandma lived in Madisonville. If you ask me, the divorce was just a ruse to get rid of Claire. I don't rightly recall if they even came to her funeral, though I imagine they must have. Claire dropped into the middle of my perfect life out of nowhere. One minute, everyone was hanging on my every word. The next, they were hanging all over Claire. I can't blame them, really. 
She was different and exciting. She came from Nashville, which was where famous people were from. She wore her hair in a bob instead of a ponytail. She wore makeup. At the time, I don't think any of us girls even knew where to find makeup, let alone wear it. I knew from experience that being different was either really, really good, or it could be bad. Being different from me had started out bad, but I'd worked with it until I had something. I'd earned my place at the top. Then Claire comes along, and she doesn't have to work at anything at all. She waltzes in with her big city designer jeans and usurps me. Our war really started one day when she claimed that mediums were of the devil. Her big city church pastor had a whole sermon on it to their thousand-member congregation, she told us. I'm not sure we had a thousand people in our whole town, let alone a single church. Everyone looked at me when she said that. I laughed it off and asked her how mediums could be of the devil when it was God that made everything. God doesn't make anything evil, does he? I asked her. Are you saying God created evil on purpose? I had her on that one. She only batted her big, mascara-clumped eyelashes at everyone and shrugged. That's just what my pastor said, she said. And a thousand people believe him. I had to defuse this, and fast. I could feel my power slipping. Without it, I had nothing. Claire could take her powdered nose elsewhere and still be fine. Yeah, a thousand people believed Hitler, too, I said. We all know how that turned out. Everyone laughed at that, and I knew I'd won. For now. I could see that this was going to be an ongoing battle, though, if I didn't finish it for good. So, I did. I played sweet with Claire after that and soothed her into thinking she was top dog while I considered how to get rid of her permanently. Russ had been an accident and what I considered a divine act of God. Claire, I was going to have to take care of myself. It was when she mentioned to me after school one day that she'd never learned how to swim that my plan came together. Can I tell you a secret? I asked her one day. There's a special pond where fairies live, and I hear voices there. They tell me stuff I can't know. It's how I can tell the future. Oh, there's no such things as fairies, my pastor said. Anything that talks to you that isn't human is a demon, she tells me. You shouldn't go there. Her eyes gleamed with greed. I knew she gossiped about me behind my back. To know the secret of my power was a mighty lure. I dropped the bait. I worry about that, honestly. Would you come with me to see what you think? I asked her. I don't want to be consorting with demons. I worry for my soul. But you can't tell anyone. She swallowed it, hook and all, and agreed. There really was a murky little pond in the woods... But I didn't go there much and didn't believe in fairies. Not really. There was a bit of a bend in the river that fed it that had some rocks and whatnot kind of stacked up and a beaver dam. You couldn't see it from the road and there was a nice back way to get to it from town. All of that made it perfect. I packed us a picnic lunch, complete with butterscotch pudding cups. I'd seen Claire in the lunchroom. She couldn't resist a pudding cup, and butterscotch was her favorite. I'd watched her polish off a six-pack by herself in one lunch hour. The pudding cup had become a sort of offering for her friendship by girls and boys alike. Who was I not to pay homage to the queen? I also snuck six of my mom's Libriums from off her nightstand, ground them up, and packed them in a small jelly jar with some broken pets. Then I packed my favorite Zorro Pez dispenser with only a few Pez loaded. Claire made the perfect victim. She asked no questions. She was so bent on exposing me, she hurried us along. She told no one where we were going, lest she also be accused of consorting with demons. 
The only hiccup in the whole plan was getting her to relax long enough for lunch. I told her I had low blood sugar and said I could die if I didn't get some sugar. Her tune changed a little when she saw the pudding cups. Now I had her attention. I popped the tops and handed her one with a plastic spoon. We carefully licked our lids clean, and then I pulled out my pest dispenser and emptied the contents into my pudding cup. I took a bite like it was the best thing in the world. It actually was pretty good. Of course, Little Miss Nosy was all over it. Why do you add Pez to your pudding? She asked me. Oh, you never had it like that? I asked her. God, it's the best thing ever. It's the only way I'll eat pudding now. Here, try it. I pulled back out my Pez dispenser and handed it to her. She looked so sad when she found it empty. I had to take a quick bite of pudding to hide my smile. Oh, sorry, I tell her. I do have some spares if you don't mind some are broken. I keep them around for my blood sugar. I tossed her the jar, and with no questions asked, she dumped all of it in her pudding and mixed it in. Finish your pudding and then we'll listen for fairies, I told her. I really didn't have to convince her. Claire had scooped all the pudding out and was carefully licking the inside of the can before I was half done. I gave her another, which she polished off almost as fast. She tossed her empties in the grass when she was done. The Pez made my first one taste kind of bitter, she said between bites. I don't like it like that. I couldn't really think of a reply, so I just scooped in another bite of my own. Afterwards, I picked up our empty trash and dropped it in a sandwich bag. I really didn't want to leave any incriminating evidence behind. I was all for saving Mother Nature, but I was saving myself first. Now, we just lay back and wait, I told her. When we're completely relaxed, the fairies come. I lay back on our blanket, my arms behind my head, and waited. It was a good plan. The full stomach and the sound of water lulled me without any sleeping pills at all. Claire didn't stand a chance. After about 20 minutes, I heard a slight snort, and I opened an eye to peek at her. Claire was full-on knocked out. Her mouth was hanging open slack, and for just a second, I remembered Russ and the feast of flies on his face. Right then I may have quit, I got such a chill. Russ had been an accident, really. I hadn't pushed the pitchfork into him. This time, I had given Claire the pills that caused her to pass out. When she woke up, she'd know something was up, and she'd tell everyone. They'd know I was a fake and that I believed in fairies, or worse. She'd claim I was trying to kill her and I'd go to jail anyways. They'd probably pin Russ on me, too. I was in a sticky spot. I had to kill Claire MacDonald. And considering everything, it was really self-defense. I mean, all things considered. That steeled me. I bounced to my feet. It was super private where we were. But right then, it felt like there was a crowd of witnesses in all those trees. I wasn't planning to dream this up as a murder. Claire was just going to be the stupid girl that went swimming and drowned herself. I slipped off her shoes and placed them at the water's edge, and then rolled her in, face down. I expected her to just peacefully roll into the water, sink, and be done with. So I was as surprised as anyone when she started thrashing. I guess the water woke her up. For just a second, I stood there watching in horror. She pushed her knees into the mud, found purchase, and began pushing herself up. She looked like something at a drive-in movie coming out of the water like that. Her blonde hair hung straight down, obscuring her face while she sputtered and choked. She was coming out of the water, and I could see my own doom rising up with her. I had to act, so I stepped into the mud and pushed her back down. I think Mama's sleeping pills did work mostly, because she wasn't that hard to hold down, all things considered. Claire was a big girl compared to me, 
by a full head and some inches. But I pushed down in the middle of her back and held her there until she stopped pushing back. Then I held her down some more, just in case. Finally, when I figured she was finished, I tried to shove her to the middle of the pond so she could float free. But she didn't. I had never actually gone into the pond. I had just assumed it would get deeper further in. Turns out, it was really just a glorified mud puddle. I walked Claire's body all the way to the middle of the pond, and it still only went to my hips. How was she supposed to have drowned in water this shallow? Then, I noticed another oversight on my part. Claire was dressed in jeans and a peasant blouse. I panicked, got out of the water, and ran for it. This was obviously a murder! When I hit the road, I slowed down and my brain kicked back in. Things were bad, but I didn't need to make them worse by running down Main Street covered in mud. I snuck into the side yard of a house with no cars in the driveway and rinsed myself off with the hose before taking all the back ways home. By now, I had dealt with the panic and come to grips with my mistakes. To fix it all, I just needed a killer again. I listed all the people in town, but I couldn't think of anyone I wanted to send to prison. I think I felt a little bad about Igor, but that had really been survival of the misfits, not personal. Naming someone this time... Frankly, I liked everyone in town. That's when I got the big idea to blame it on a drifter. There were always homeless people running through town. They'd ask for free coffee at the diner and try to sneak tips off the tables when they left. No one liked bums, and I wouldn't even have to name a specific one. They all looked alike, and how would anyone know a name? It was perfect. I relaxed then. Claire was gone, and I knew who did it. Just in case, I tossed all my clothes in the washer before Mama came home and took a bath. By the time she walked in, I was in bed pretending to be asleep. Again, I waited until she got settled before I started screaming. There was also a lot less screaming than last time. I was a young woman now. Of course, my mom came running in. As soon as she flipped on the light, I sat straight up in bed with a faraway look and told her, Claire McDonald is dead. Then I buried my head in my lap and started crying. My mama wasted no time. She ran to the kitchen and I could hear her dialing up the sheriff. Within the hour, he was at my house with a couple of other men, ready to avenge the death of an innocent girl. Let me tell you, People get worked up more over a pretty young girl dying than anyone else. I told them where I had seen Claire in my supposed dream. In a shallow pond, I said. North of town, hidden from the road and by a beaver dam. I thought I was being pretty vague, so it would take them a few days to find it. But damned if one of the men knew exactly where I was talking about. The sheriff sat down next to me and took my hand, looking me in the eyes. I know this is a terrible burden on you, but we need to know who did it. Can you be brave for me, honey, and tell me who killed Claire? I bit my lip and puckered my face to keep the giggles inside, and managed to just nod. I described a man, slowly, as if it cost me great pain, but really it was giving me time to think. He had dirty brown hair, I said, and a red beard that covered his neck. Gray and orange flannel shirt, baggy jeans with oil stains on the back pockets and ripped out knees. He had a military surplus backpack and, I paused for the drama, an earring in one ear, like a pirate. I regretted the earring as soon as I said it. That was a childish addition, but it was done. The killer was named, Claire was dead, and I had reasserted my hold over my kingdom. My work here was done, or so I thought. 
You can only imagine how surprised I was when the sheriff called my mother a week later and asked if I'd come in and identify the drifter. The chances they had found a man that matched my fictional description were next to impossible, I thought. Down to the pirate earring? But that's exactly who I found handcuffed next to the sheriff's desk at the station. He even had a gold hoop in his left ear. Is this the man you saw in your dream? The sheriff asked me. I was so surprised, I just nodded. Now that may seem terrible to you, but what was I going to do? But then that man looked up at me, and I saw no life in his eyes. He'd already committed so many crimes. What was one more? Obviously he was being punished for something he'd done before. Otherwise, how could I describe him so accurately? They locked him in a cell after that, and would you believe, they found half a bottle of Librium on him. Claire's autopsy report found she'd been drugged. No more questions. I took that as a sign from God again. A week or two later, the sheriff called to see if he could take me out for an ice cream. Of course, I said yes. I don't want to sound greedy, but I was hoping he'd give me another $20 bill, too. Instead... He offered me a job. If I could help his department solve crimes by sharing my dreams, they would pay me $100 per crime. Now, technically, I was a professional when I accepted that first $20. But now, before I'd even left high school, I had a lucrative career with the police. I accepted on the spot, and he gave me a crisp $100 bill. I'd never even seen one. When I showed Mama, she said she'd only seen one a few times in her life, and we went down to the bank to start me an account. It's been a good move all around, and over the years, I've solved more murders than I can remember. My own Mama was even murdered when I figured out she was sneaking money out of my account a few years later. Her killer turned out to be the sleazy new man she'd started dating, I didn't like him anyways. It always works out for me in the end. Now, you might be wondering what all this has to do with you being here. <laughs> One of these days I'm going to have some smart cookie in here that connects the dots from the get-go. It's super obvious, and I can't believe you people never get it by now. Here's the baby explanation. Were it not for the sheriff paying me so handsomely for my lie... I'd never have realized that being a psychic was so rewarding. I don't mean with just money, either. Being a psychic means I can see what no one else can. No one can fact-check me or argue. No questions. Ever. It's like being a writer, but getting paid for it. And the power. You would never guess how much power a small, middle-aged woman can wield. I mean, obviously you never guessed because you're here now. I know I said I was a professional liar, but if you really think about it, I'm really just making up stories to tell a bigger truth about you and most of humanity. Here's the truth I send you out with. We're all liars, but most of you lie to yourself. That's what makes it so easy for me. You all believe what you want to believe. Truth is a matter of perspective. The only thing different between me and you, to be honest, is that I'm a professional. I put my lies in the bank. And now, finally, I'll tell you the dream I'm going to have. They'll find your body in the trunk of your car two days from now, in the back of Grapevine Cemetery, the one just off from Penny Ryle Parkway. A plastic bag will be over your head and named as the cause of your death. Don't worry, it'll be quick and easy. Your fingers will all be cut off with pruning shears. But that will be done after so you won't suffer. In my dream, I hear crying echo through the gravestones. People love a little theater added in, I find. In case you're curious, your killer is an out-of-work gardener from Louisville. I got his name from the White Pages, so I don't believe you'd know him. He drinks too much, so his wife left him months ago. 
He got fired from his last job for stealing, but charges were dropped. Your fingers will be found in a wooden cigar box he keeps in his tool sheds. The shears will be sitting conveniently on the workbench with a rag and some bleach. The police will pat themselves on the back, having caught him just before he was about to dispose of the evidence and get away. The better the police get to look, the higher the reward, it seems. As for me, I will humbly accept my payment, praising God for giving me this special gift that allows us to rid the world of evil. Donations will pour in, along with fan mail. Really, I'm just giving everyone, <laughs> almost everyone, what they want. And now that this is out of the way, I really must get going. We all have our roles in life, and this is yours, bless your heart. I guess all the lies finally caught up with you. Hello, kiddies. So, you want access to the Wicked Archives, do you? Well, it takes money to keep the lights on and keep our beasties fed. Trust me, you don't want them hungry. They might just start eating the writers and then where would we be? Visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash wicked library and pledge your support to the show. For $2 a month, I'll give you a key to our collection of classic episodes. For $5 a month, I'll let you hear the bonus stories before the rest of our listeners. Even more tantalizing rewards await for those who want to sacrifice more to us. <laughs> Over 70 classic episodes are lurking deep in the private area of the library, just waiting to be heard by you. Pledge yourself to the library today, and you'll be ours forever. You're going to like it here, I think. <laughs> How much is it for people to enjoy the private area of the librarian, Dan? <laughs>